Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Can paranormal parasites actually attach themselves to you as their host? What happens when that happens? What can you do about it? Hello and welcome to the 829th edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Uh, I am Ben and those gripping questions came from my co-host, partner in the Paranormal Adventures, and Dad Paul. And today we bring you a legendary guest on a very serious subject who we haven't had on in quite a long time, actually. And we welcome your calls today. The uh, number is 401-766-1240. That's from anywhere. You can email paul at behindtheparanormal.com or you can contact us by Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Joining us after a hiatus of seven years, that's inexcusable, his last appearance was on our CBS radio edition on February 17th, 2013, is our dear friend Murray M. Silver Jr., a legend in the paranormal world, especially in his native Savannah, Georgia. Murray is a true Renaissance man, author, historian, publisher, paranormal researcher, experiencer, political commentator, educator, photographer, rock music journalist, and promoter. He has worked uh, with the likes of Pink Floyd, Genesis, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Bob Dylan, Elton John, and Peter Gabriel, among others. Murray's first book, published in 1982, <clears throat> was Great Balls of Fire, the uncensored story of Jerry Lee Lewis, which became the hit movie Great Balls of Fire in 1989, starring Dennis Quaid and Winona Ryder, among other people. Among Murray's adventures during this period was being introduced to the Dalai Lama by their mutual friend Richard Gere. This led to Murray uh, changing the course of his life, and for a number of years, Murray wrote articles about China's oppression of Tibet and arranged tours of Tibetan Buddhist monks to colleges and museums throughout the United States. More recently, Murray became the author of Behind the Moss Curtain and other great Savannah stories based mainly on Murray's own adventures with ghosts. As if that weren't enough, Murray ran for mayor of Savannah in 2015. Unfortunately for Savannah, he was unsuccessful. So, Murray Silver, welcome back to Behind the Paranormal. After that introduction, the show is almost over. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's a lot, but it's, it's just too interesting not to read it. Well, you're very <laughs> kind. It's, listen, it's great to hear both of your voices again. Your right has been entirely too long, and that's inexcusable. But first things first, I want to congratulate you on the success of this program because I remember in the early days, the listening audience consisted of whoever was sitting next to me and whoever was sitting next to you. <laughs> and uh, and now I understand your audience numbers in the millions, and rightfully so, because there I do not know of another source of reputable, reliable information about what is referred to as paranormal uh, anywhere else on this planet, and and it is a great testament to to your success that that you uh, have reached this point. And now I will tell you that also, Spirit advises me that before this year is out, you're going to be embarking on a new phase of your career, in which you're now going to be uh, launching a new television, a network television program. And I have seen it in my mind's eye. It's a black set with an oval table. Both of you guys are sitting around. Sometimes you've got more than one guest. And you're able to uh, to examine uh, evidence and film and photographs and recordings. And before fall, Spirit tells me that you will be embarking on this new uh, chapter in your career. So well, I sure hope so. <laughs> well, I, Murray, you can come on anytime you want. So, what, what was it that Mark Twain once said that I can live for six months on one nice compliment? I believe that's the, the, yes. yes. That, that, that's and, that's a pretty accurate uh, rendition. So. so. <laughs> Just two important things have happened since you've begun this show, and it is incumbent on me to tell your audience because you won't. Number one, this world, not just the paranormal, but the normal world, which I insist is all the same, everyone owes you a debt of gratitude for having developed a vocabulary and lexicon which now makes it easier for people like me to explain what it is we're going through. When I was a child in the 50s and 60s and having my first experiences, I was basically um, relegated to ghost, spirit, demon, angel, alien. Those were my choices. And I was not able to accurately explain to people what was going on simply because I did not have the vocabulary. But you guys, through this program and your books, have done a brilliant job 
of adding to the vocabulary, which makes it easier for us to speak in greater detail. And and the the studies would not be where they are today if it wasn't for your efforts. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Ben's going to start us off with our first question. Oh, yes, and it might be our last. Who knows? Uh, Murray, all we have to do is ask you one question, and yeah. we you just carry the show along. And, and you any, do it brilliantly. Exactly. Anytime any new question comes to mind, it's like you anticipate, and then you're there, and you answer it. So let's just start off with something seemingly simple. Tell us about parasites, and how have you learned to deal with them? Well, um, gentlemen, what you refer to as parasite was, as I said earlier, that was a word that was unfamiliar to me until you came up with it. I, I always referred to them as attachments or um, familiar spirits or ghosts. But um, here's the interesting thing. Since I talked to you last, I have had a number of experiences that are truly horrific. They are more, more horrific than anything I've ever seen in movies or read in books. The kind of things that would make Stephen King pee his pants. And, and the thing is that um, some of these things uh, I would write about or make movies about, but I, I hesitate, if only because I don't think that some people would ever forgive me for it. Uh, they are images that you would never be able to remove from your mind. And, and even worse, gentlemen, the reason I have not indulged in, in the business of this business is simply because there was a young man who recently died trying to do exactly what it is that I do. And I, I often remind people that ghost hunting makes a terrible hobby. Nothing good can come of it. And when this young man died simply trying to do what I have been doing, I had to step back and take a long look at what it is that I do. And I, I am very careful about not, not encouraging people to pursue this as a hobby. So that being said, what is interesting to me is that the, 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 the biggest events that have happened to me, quote unquote paranormal in the last few years, have a common thread. And what I want to point out at the top though, and it is extremely important that I mention this now, the things that happened to me I did not go looking for. They were not the result of a ghost hunt or an investigation or an exploration. These are events that came for me. And, and I, the only way I can explain this to you is this, is, is using resonance as the, as the reason. You know, in, in our early days, one of the problems that we all had was that we weren't getting any help from a science that said that if I see ghosts and you don't, then they can't be said to truly exist. And, and unless you could prove them by the scientific method, it didn't exist. And now science is having to admit that, that resonance is the reason why some of us see ghosts and others do not. And for those who are unfamiliar with resonance, it is the basis of the law of attraction, which basically holds that people are like radio stations. We have a frequency with which we interact with this universe, and we attract what we put out. And so, therefore, if I attract ghosts, it's because I'm putting out that vibe, and that's what's coming back to me. And just because I do that, it doesn't mean that I see all ghosts. I might only see one or two, but this is the point that I'm trying to make. Science is now having to admit that we are, are having individual experiences that are just as valid as if it was something that could be proven through the scientific method. So that being said, um, the things that have happened to me have a common thread. So I want to relate to you um, what I think is the most telling Example, which will answer this one question. Um, and, and remind me now, every element of this is a key and, and an element, it's an ingredient into the, the soup here. Uh, I was once driving down the street of Savannah, Georgia, and I heard a voice internally suggest to me that I should stop into a shop and buy a set of guitar strings for a guitar I hadn't played since I was in college. And I had never been in the store. And I found myself pulling over in the parking lot and walking inside to buy these guitar strings, and it had been, a very, it had been 40 years since I'd played the guitar. And um, I, a lot had changed in the world of guitars since then, and I was at a loss. I had encountered a wall of strings, and I needed some help. A young man approached me, he was lean and mean, and he was hard, 
and he was a rock and roller, and he was so tatted up that I wasn't sure what race he was because his skin looked more blue, green, and red than white or brown. And his name was Nick, and he came over to me, and he helped me pick out strings. And as we were checking out, gentlemen, I noticed on his arm he had the tattoo of Marie Laveau, the voodoo queen of New Orleans. And I I asked him, why is that on your arm? And he said, wait a minute, you know who Marie Laveau was? And I said, well, yes, I do. Uh, And for those of you in the audience who don't know who Marie was, at one point in time, she was the most powerful person in New Orleans in the 19th century. And everyone sought her favor. And even in death, uh, her, her grave, a mausoleum, has become a shrine. And people on a daily basis will besiege Marie for favors. And if Marie grants them, she also exacts a price. And that price is often as dear as the favor she has bestowed upon you. And uh, I once had a run-in with Marie many years ago, and I wrote about it in my memoir. And so I told the young man, you know, if you knew who that was, you would not have her likeness etched onto your body. And he said, well, no, man, you don't understand. I'm really into the whole voodoo scene. He said, in fact, the reason I moved to Savannah is because it's the most haunted city in the United States, and I'm all about ghosts. And I said, well, this is neither the time nor place to discuss such things, but I happen to have a copy of my memoir in the car, and there's an entire chapter on Marie Laveau, and I suggest that you read it. And if you want to, call me and we'll discuss it. Well, gentlemen, long story short, young man Nick called me two days later and begged me to meet him and talk to him. And he told me, he said, Mr. Silver, I want to do exactly what you do. I want to go look for ghosts, and I want to find them. And I want to write about them, and I want to do tours, and I want my whole life to be all about spirit. And I said, young man, I I know there's nothing I can say to dissuade you. All I can tell you is to proceed with caution. That being said, gentlemen, Nick went out and found a job working as a tour guide in a haunted house here in Savannah that's operated as a tourist attraction. And in a town that has 50 ghost tours, Very few of them take you inside an actual haunted house. Now, some of them will take you into a haunted bar or restaurant, but they won't take you into a haunted residence. And there's a place in town called the Sorrel Weed House that was uh, being renovated by a man who ran out of money. And when he ran out of money, he decided to open this as a tourist attraction and get the public to pay for its renovation. But the thing about the Sorrel Weed House, gentlemen, is it's one of those... um, carnival-type atmospheres where much of what is said about it is not true. And then along comes a film crew that wants to do a uh, documentary about the hauntings of Savannah, and they set up inside the Sorrel Weed House. And they bring with them some charlatan who claims he is going to do uh, a seance and an exorcism of the place and see what happens. Well, he managed to open up a portal that he could not close. And all of a sudden, the Sorrel Weed House was filled with an energy, that low-level Ouija board kind of spooky, kooky stuff that basically gives you a headache. And um, now, all of a sudden, tourists are paying their good money to go inside this place and encounter this low-level energy. And Nick got a job being a tour guide at the Sorrel Weed House. He was uh, able to support his young wife and their, their infant child. And he was having the time of his life, and uh, last I heard, he was having a big time running the show at the Soul Weed House. However, uh, the longer Nick worked there, he began to change. He started to drink, and then he started to drink heavily, and then he started to stay out at night, and then he developed other interests. And then he came home and advised his young bride that he had fallen in love with another woman who worked at the Sorrel Weed House and was going to leave her for that woman. And then, gentlemen, the next thing that happened to young Nick was he dropped dead of a heart attack while on the job. He's a young, he wasn't 30 years old. He was in perfect health. And the autopsy could not discover a reason for his death. And so I tell you all of that to tell you this. I, uh, one day I received a check in the mail, a royalty check, and I decided I was going to take it to the bank to deposit it 
when I heard a voice, an internal voice, say to me, um, don't take this to your local branch around the corner. Take this to the main office downtown. And so I I changed my mind and went downtown to deposit this check. When I walked into the main branch, I was surprised because there was no one there. There was no one in the offices. There were no customers in the lobby, nobody waiting in line. There was only one teller behind the window where there was space for five, and she was a, a Chinese girl I'd never seen before. And when I approached her and gave her the check and my identification, she looked at me and she said, you're Murray Silver? I said, yes. She said, I need to talk to you. I said, why? Well, Nick Wood is dead, and I need to speak to you about it. I said, why? She said, well, I am his wife, was his wife, and I need to speak to you. Well, I met with Mrs. Wood, and what she wanted me to know was that Nick was haunting her and her son that their little boy, all of two years old, was seeing and speaking to his father, and she did not think that he understood that his father was dead. But worse, she said, that every night around 4 o'clock in the morning, the child would wake up screaming and yelling something about daddy. And she said to me, I I am moved to ask you for help because I don't know who else to call. And I said, so what are you asking me to do, ma'am? She said, well, I want Nick. I want him gone. I want him to rest in peace. I said, okay. And so a couple of days later, she called me. She said, wait, what did you do? I said, why are you asking? She said, well, I don't see him and hear from him anymore. I said, well, I crossed him over, as, as you asked. She said, well, is he coming back? I said, no, he's not. I said, you're free to go now. And I suggest that you go home back to California where you came from, and in time your child will not remember his father, and you will go on with your life. And that's the way it will be. Now, gentlemen, I told you all of that to tell you this. The death of Nick Wood affected me tremendously. The fact that this young man had died doing what he said was the same thing I had been doing, it affected me deep. Because I never wanted anybody to use me as an example and to try to do what it is that I do, whatever your purpose may be. And I decided I would have to be very careful how I proceed from now on. And you are the only two guys that I talk to publicly. I used to do a a keynote address at the National Mensa Convention every year on the subject of spirit. And I was the highest rated speaker in the history of American Mensa. Invited back every year and I quit doing it because I did not want to contribute to people's interest in a subject matter that that would lead to such uh, results as, as with Nick Wood. So I'm very careful about what I say and to, to whom I say it to, but I will say this to you. Following Nick's death, I became very depressed. Follow me now. Mm-hmm. I became the point to where I became suicidal. And I, I had a daily conversation with myself about destroying myself. And I didn't understand it, gentlemen, because I have lived a wonderful life and continue to and did not want to destroy myself. But something was prompting me, you know, um, if you're ready to go, I can show you how to get out of here. And I realized that the voice I was hearing once again, as I had heard in the case of Nick, was not coming from me. But because it was internal, it sounded like it was coming from me. And it was during the week between Christmas and New Year, gentlemen, that I became so depressed that I actually started making plans about destroying myself. And then one night, as it is in really lousy movies, I get a phone call from a friend of mine who is a very gifted acupuncturist. And she said, I'm calling to see how you're doing. I said, I'm fine. She said, no, really, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm not so good. She said, I know. She said, my people have been talking to your people, meaning spirit guides. And she said, my people tell me that you're not doing too well. What's going on with you? And I told her, I said, Doc, I think my number is up. I think my time has come. I think I'm out of here. In fact, I don't think I'll see the new year. She said, I think you're wrong. 
She said, I think that what you have are attachments. She said, I think that you have got ghosts. She said, um, since the 6th century, Chinese acupuncturists have believed that ghosts can inhabit people and feed off of people, and the Chinese refer to them as gui. She said, fortunately, in the study of acupuncture, they also devised a way to rid you of this problem, and that's why I'm calling you. She said, I think you're eaten up with ghosts. And she said, I think it's happened because you've been chasing after them in cemeteries and haunted houses. And so at that point, she said to me, I'd like to, I said, well, you know, Doc, I'm not really in the mood to come in and have you stick pins in me. She said, no, no, this, this doesn't involve needles. And Paul, at this point, I will remind your audience that if you doubt my veracity, I want you right now to go to your computer and Google acupuncture ghost points and prepare to be surprised. <laughs> so, so this is basically, this is a, a, a 1400-year-old practice of removing what you refer to as parasite, what I refer to as ghost or attachments. This is how you remove it from yourself. And you can do it yourself. And so long story short, gentlemen, um, she proceeded to walk me through the procedure, during which I found out I had not only one, but I had three hitchhikers. I had three house guests that had attached themselves to me. And basically, one of them simply wanted the ability to enjoy food and drink and warmth and comfort, because when spirit is out of the body, it has no body to satisfy these desires, but still has the desire. And so having gone through the process of ridding myself of these attachments, I swore that I would never conduct the kind of activity that might cause them to come back. And that involves, as you gentlemen know, uh, changing the vibrational frequency, the resonance at which you encounter this world. And since then, the nature of my paranormal experiences has been altogether different, if only because... I'm no longer chasing after that Ouija board, low-level stuff, and I'm in pursuit of something higher. Murray, at this point, uh, we have a caller, so we're going to uh, put the caller on the air, and uh, they can speak with you. Yes. Uh, hello. Welcome to Behind the Paranormal on 01-1240 and uh, 99.5 FM. Hi, it's Dr. Paul Leslie. How are you? Oh, Dr. Paul Leslie, our guest, from <laughs> it's, and also a, a mutual friend of Murray's, I believe. Indeed, you, we are definitely graced with uh, Mr. Silver. How are you, Murray? Great to hear from you, Doc. How are you doing? I'm good. Here's my question. I won't take up too much time. Real quickly, what do you think the percentage of people who suffer from mental health issues is it parasitic entity-based? Doc, I'm going to tell you something that will blow your mind. Um, I... The Chinese have always believed that anybody that has an emotional problem, 99 cases out of 100, it has something to do with these attachments or these parasites. That's what the Chinese have believed for 14 centuries. What is interesting to me is that through this gifted acupuncturist I know here in Savannah, she has been able to cure people of what has been considered to be incurable with one treatment, simply by ridding them of these attachments. She mm. has been able to, to cure people of every addiction. And in, and in fact, I believe that uh, great gains have been made on the subject of multiple personality disorder, because in some cases it simply turns out to be a case of attachment or, or these parasites, as Paul and Ben have brilliantly explored in their books. So to answer your question, uh, I don't know what the percentage would be. All I can tell you is this. If, if it helps anyone to hear this message, anyone that is suffering with any type of addiction or emotional problem, it may very well be helped or solved by, by visiting an acupuncturist who is acquainted with ghost points. Now, I will say this as a caveat. If you continue to read what I've suggested to you on Google, um, you will find out that a lot of acupuncturists consider ghost points to be an archaic practice. 
and that, that medical science has advanced in the past 1,400 years. And there are not a lot of practitioners that do this. And, and I would suggest to you it's not because it isn't valid, but it's the same reason why we don't have anybody making symphonies like Beethoven anymore, is that the kind of people who could perform the surgery as an acupuncturist, there aren't many who are gifted enough to do it and do it well. But, Doc, I will say this to you. It is a valid approach to treating anyone with any sort of imbalance by by taking a look at the subject of attachment and parasite. Okay. Thank you, Murray. Uh, doctor, does that answer your question? Oh, it does. It does. And this is a fascinating discourse, as always. And I appreciate you guys for having Murray back. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We'll be talking to both of you uh, as we go. Uh, right. We're at the perfect time now for our bottom of the hour break. You're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on WOON 1240 AM and 99.5 FM in New England's beautiful Blackstone River Valley. We'll be right back with our fantastic guest, Marie Silver, so stick with us. Lou Mandeville here to tell you the only place to get your local high school and college scores, as well as the Pats, Bruins, Celtics, and Sox is on my morning sports reports. And they are right here on ON 1240, Monday through Friday on the Morning Fun Show. Local and live at 99.5 FM. Okay, welcome back to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on WON 1240 AM and 99.5 FM here in the, the Blackstone River Valley of New England. And uh, and would also like to call, I'll give the number again, we usually don't do that, but 401-766-1240 from anywhere. And we have, uh, before we continue uh, with Murray here, we have uh, two more questions for him from listeners. This is from our faithful listener, Peter, in Bogota, Colombia. And uh, what does Peter have for us uh, this week, Ben? Well, Peter uh, writes to us, uh, your previous shows, uh, Murray, you have talked a lot about parasites feeding on negative energy. Why can't they feed on positive energy? Well, I believe, I believe uh, they do, but it's not a parasite then in that event. Uh, I'm going to tell you guys something fascinating. In my life, I have been extremely fortunate to meet a number of exceptional people, from Martin Luther King to the Dalai Lama to Paul McCartney. And, and it, what is amazing to me is that these people who are singularly gifted uh, are so because of the way they resonate, resonate with this universe and what they attract. I remember having a fascinating conversation with Paul McCartney, and I asked him, I said, listen, you've written not just one or two really great songs, you've written hundreds, hundreds. Nobody else in history has done what you've done. How are you different? And Paul McCartney explained to me, he said, you know, um, it's I'm not the one who's writing it. He said, um, all music is, is up there somewhere in the ether. He said, and it's my job as a musician to pull it down here. And he said, you know, I once woke up one morning humming a tune that I couldn't get out of my head. He said, I thought I'd heard it somewhere. He said, but um, I sat down at breakfast, and I'm, I didn't have any lyrics for the song. I just knew the tune. He said, and he called the song Scrambled Eggs because that's what he was having for breakfast. He goes into the studio that day, and he hums the song for for John Lennon and George Martin. And he says, have you guys heard this tune? And they said, no, 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 that must be original with you. And and the song turned out to be Yesterday. And Paul McCartney said that he simply woke up humming the tune. So the point that I'm making to you is that whether it's the Dalai Lama or my father-in-law, who is a gifted scientist and one of the most brilliant math minds of all time, what is interesting to me is these people live exceptional lives because of the way that they resonate with this universe. And I do believe that people at that level are attracting not parasites, but all sorts of benevolent beings, um, angels, whatever whatever they may be or what you want to call them, but it's true. What, what your caller says is true. You attract what you put out. And, and if you're dealing with low-level stuff, then you're going to get parasites. And if you're dealing with the higher resonance, then you're going to get something higher. And and I and it is remarkable to me that the most special people I've met in this lifetime understood that they understood that principle. There you have it. Interesting. Well, there's also a part two, but I, I believe you already kind of answered that. Um, <laughs> Murray has a way of doing that. Yeah, well, yeah. very good at that game. Um, 
Peter basically goes on to say, uh, I was thinking of an example of parasites on whales, and the parasites are feeding on healthy whales, I assume. Wouldn't that translate to positive energy? Which you basically, you know, answered that question. So, bully. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we have a question here. You know, that, although that, that does bear in mind sort of a, a family story from us. Uh, one of my father's cousins uh, from New England here was Julia Ward Howe. Mm. And in 1862, she was in a hotel in Washington, D.C., because of the, during the, the Civil War was really pretty bad at that point. Not that it wasn't bad at any other point. But she woke up one day, and uh, one morning, about 4 a.m., it was still dark, and she just got up and sat down and wrote out some lyrics to a tune she had heard from a band the day before, and that turned out to be the Battle Hymn of the Republic, as we have it today. Just yeah. came right to her. Uh, this is a. We have Phil from Orange, Massachusetts, a very faithful listener, and mm. uh, Phil has a question or two here. Alrighty, so let's jump right into Phil's questions. Um, let's see. Uh, he, he prefaces it by saying his question will sound facetious, but it's not. Uh, your introduction referred to paranormal parasites, quote unquote, uh, as if there are two types: uh, parasites who hang around like tourists and don't bother anyone, and the kind who display surreal and malicious behavior. Uh, do you feel there are two types of parasites? Well, that question should be better answered by you guys because you brilliantly outlined in your book that you have already identified nine different classes of parasites. You are in a much better position than me because you've had authentic experiences with them, whereas what I have had a contact with seems to be more of a type and, and here's the interesting thing. I will go back to what I said earlier. Uh, I can tell you what it is that happened to me, and I can tell you what it looked like and sounded like, but just because I identify, it doesn't mean I know what that really is. What mm-hmm. I refer to as ghost, what you refer to as parasite, I still don't know actually what that is because that thing knows more about itself than I do. It shows me a face. I'm not sure, and to this day, I'm still not exactly certain what it is that I'm encountering. I can just tell you what it does. I can tell you what the symptoms are, but I can't tell you the root cause. And it is something that continues to keep me interested in the subject matter. I, you know, what you call parasite, what I call ghost or attachment, it may not be either. It may be something entirely different. It may be a plasma-based life form that has nothing to do with us. There's a lot of possibilities in this world. But what is interesting is, as time goes on, you're making advancements, I'm making advancements, your other guests are making advancements that now make it easier for us to identify these things. But I will let you guys answer the question that your caller has placed. Okay, well, we've done that on a number of shows, and Phil is a faithful listener, and we'll... uh... We'll, we'll extrapolate uh, further at some point, but uh, Murray, this is your day. So uh, this is Murray's day. Yes. Which I guess um, the second question is kind of a follow-up, um, which I believe is it's it's an interesting question, um, and it kind of leads into something I wanted to ask too. But I'll I'll basically leave it to Phil's question here, which is uh, whether or not benign parasites, quote unquote, actually exist. I would also like to know if parasites tend to show up in times and in countries which become inundated by senseless hatred. For example, Nazi Germany, where occult practices were accepted and incredibly diverse. Uh, Do you feel parasites somehow encouraged the Germans to pursue those practices, or do you feel the parasites showed up uh, whenever they pleased, and it is pointless, uh, it is a pointless, it is pointless to predict their prevalence? It is interesting. Well, like I said, um, the exceptional people I have known in this world, whether they're good or bad, um, manifest something that other things, other entities feed off of. Uh, I won't say that all of the Nazis were motivated by parasites, but I'll put it to you this way. If you have ever visited the site of a concentration camp like Dachau, which I have done, um, the earth is so terribly scarred by what happened there that it will never be healed again. And there is when you come away, you feel something on, on many different levels. And to answer the, the question uh, more specifically, um, wherever there is any, any great emotion of any kind, it draws 
a, 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 a reaction that resonates with it. So, yes, it is theoretically possible that great hatred uh, is fed on by, by parasites and so forth, but I don't have any evidence of that. I can only tell you what has happened to me, and I can tell you convincingly that in the last seven years, the things that I have encountered had one thing in common, and that there was an entity that fed off of that energy, and that once I was free from parasite, once I was free from attachment, I discontinued the kind of activity that courts it, and I have tried to remain free and clear. And let me tell you something. It starts as simple as diet. Um, it is amazing to me that um, once I get rid of attachment, I, longer, I no longer craved alcohol. I no longer crave certain kinds of foods because I found out that one of the signs of attachment is that you have a desire for that which is not natural to you. And in my case, I had an overwhelming desire to drink beer, and I was not a beer drinker. But in getting rid of attachments, the desire for it completely disappeared. And that's why I say to you, a gifted acupuncturist is able to heal someone of alcoholism simply by getting rid of the attachments that have moved in on you so that they can uh, join you at the bar. So um, I'm not trying to wander away from the, the, the original question. I'm just trying to say to you that in my personal experiences, parasites simply attach themselves to you because you have the physical body to satisfy their desires. So I guess let's let's sort of zoom out on the microscope here and let's let's sort of shift back into a subject that you brought up earlier in the show which was sort of the the pop ghost hunting or hobbyist ghost hunting and and sort of how dangerous it, it really is. And you brought up a really interesting point which is that these sort of emotional places um, for, for lack of better words, until we come up with a better way to describe it. Let's say, like, I don't know, um, a, a, a abandoned cemetery. You know, New England is full of those. Or uh, abandoned mental institutions, abandoned schools, things like that, that, you know, are great, you know, ghost hunting destinations, which anybody from, you know, our local listening area could think of a few. And these places tend to draw people. For whatever reason, as as much as places like Stonehenge or even you know positive places tend to draw people as well, do you believe that it's? I'm trying to think of a way to kind of kind of articulate the question. Do you believe that a certain sort of person is attracted to these emotional areas? Perhaps maybe some sort of trauma in their past brings them there do you believe that it's it's a trap a trick some sort of hunting tactic from parasites what do, what do you believe is the draw of these sort of hobbyist ghost hunters uh, some in many of these cases uh, people are drawn to past lives uh, they are led back to places where they lived or died and I can tell you examples that would literally blow your mind but but um, you know I will I will tell you guys since I talked to you last, I, I appeared on uh, one of the early segments of Ghost Adventures with Zach Bagans mm. when he came to Savannah and he did an investigation of Moon River Brewery, which after a dozen seasons is still one of his top two or three highest rated episodes. Uh, you can go on YouTube and find it. But in any event, um, more people recognize me through that than anything else I've ever done, including Great Balls of Fire and the Dalai Lama. And I, sometimes I think I could invent the cure to cancer, and there are still more people who recognize me from ghost adventures than anything <laughs> else. <laughs> I tell you that to tell you this. There are, there are th hundreds of thousands of people come to Savannah, Georgia, for a haunted experience. And having seen that program, they will go to Moon River Brewery. They're looking for an authentic experience. And I often say to them, well, let me ask you something. If you go into a haunted place and find a ghost, what are you going to do with it? Mm. And they say, well, I just want to see it. I want to take a picture. I said, well, what are you going to do if it goes home with you? Hmm. Even worse, it goes home in you. And at that point, they look at me and they think, well, that's not going to happen. Well, it does. But my point to you is that there is what you've touched on is, is the thing that compels people to do this in the first place. I think that in a lot of cases, people are looking for proof of spirit 
so that they know that they have a soul. And I think that they're concerned about what happens to the soul. Because the interesting thing is that science still does not admit that we have one. And science still does not admit that that spirit exists. Now, all religions believe that we have a spirit, that we have a soul, but none of them can explain it. And now that churches and religions are breaking down, people are being forced to look at the quote-unquote paranormal to find something to believe in. They, they want to find a ghost or a spirit so they'll know that, yes, this stuff exists. And it's, it's unfortunate that this is what they have to do, but the reasons why hundreds of thousands, millions of people are even interested in the subject matter is because they have unresolved spiritual issues. Some people are looking for that past life connection. Some people have a problem with past lives breaking through into this lifetime, and they need to find closure. So what do they do? They go off in search of that thing, that place, that experience, and I can tell you conclusively that I have been a part of, of situations where people have encountered and found the root cause of past lives and and it is a phenomenal thing when you, you when you reunite past and present. So yes, I believe it's not just a certain kind of person that's interested in this. I believe that everybody is interested in it at some level. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting point because arguably, you know, science and religion exist because of the paranormal. And trying to understand the world around us, we have to build frameworks in order to understand it. And I, I suppose if, you know, we, we live in a very interesting society that you can argue is sort of a post-enlightenment society where we have elements of materialistic sciences that we tend to focus on very heavily and really, really kind of involve ourselves in it, you know, i.e. with technology kind of constantly tethering us to one another artificially. But also at the same time, there's sort of that dualistic um, element of wanting to know that there's something beyond that. And I suppose for some, religion just doesn't fill that void anymore. And in in that, I, I can see the appeal of, of someone who feels disillusioned by not only materialistic society and sort of the breakdown of what seems like almost an, an innate free will that's constantly being messed with by marketing, technology, whatever, and looking for something beyond that, or maybe trying to return to something that our ancestors knew. Maybe it's something unconscious. Maybe it's a conscious effort. And so, you know, the sort of t paranormal tourism may be just the first step down a both very enlightening and a very dangerous path if you don't know what you're doing. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, well, I'll tell you something. You can go all the way through medical school and you won't hear the word soul or spirit mentioned once. Um, science is still woefully behind what we're on top of. Science says that we still haven't proved that man has a soul, and, and consequently that's how far we still have to go. Now, I, I will tell you something that, that you'll get a kick out of. I was uh, recently approached by two women who were visiting Savannah who didn't want to take the typical ghost tour. They had heard about me, and they asked me to take them on a private tour. And I don't do tours, not for money, not for love, for no reason do I do tours. Now, I have showed friends around, uh, family, but I don't, I don't do that for the reasons previously mentioned. However, one of the ladies took me aside and she said, look, uh, my friend has recently been given a diagnosis of a, of an illness that is going to end her life and right soon. And she has never really bothered to consider what happens when you die. And if there is a life after death, um, if there's a spirit that, that survives us in death, and she'd kind of like to know what the options are. And if you can show her ghost, then she thinks that maybe it's an indication that yes, the spirit survives us in death and goes on somewhere and does something. And she said, I will do anything if, if you can show us. Well, I took them out and showed them stuff that blew their minds. And the only reason I tell you this is that the woman in question was um, a hotshot at Harvard Medical School. 
And and she later sent me on her stationery a thank you note and a gift of a Harvard shirt that was emblazoned with the crest. And she said, um, what you did for me was more than anybody at the school could help me with. And that is to let me know that, yes, that we have a soul and it does survive us in death. So, look, gentlemen, as far as we've come and as far as you've come in the past seven years, we still have a very long way to go in trying to fill in the gap between a science that says spirit does not exist and a religion that says it exists but it can't explain it. Well, as we always say, Murray, it's the first day of school still. So let's take a moment now before we run out of time. Tell us more about where people can find out more about you, where they can get your books, etc., Well, Paul, um, my books are out of print. The only way most people find them these days is on eBay. I have largely gone out of the book business. Um, I don't do the lectures anymore. I don't do – and here's – because here's the thing, Paul. Um, What I am doing is I'm doing these – I'm caught up in these these authentic experiences, and I am am not concerned about doing it – for, to, to create something like a book or a movie. In fact, I, I, I refuse to do it because something bizarre happens anytime money rears its ugly head. And I like to try to keep things pure. I never want anyone to think that I do what I do for commerce. And in no way, shape, or form is this intended to be uh, a even what could be perceived as a criticism of what you do because you provide a vital service at a time when it is greatly needed, and as I said, there's nowhere else I know that people can go for thoughtful, reasonable discourse on these subject matters. But that said, um, my life right now is taken up with caring for people. The people closest to me are sick. They will not be getting better. And I'm encountering spirit on new and different levels, and I'm simply trying to understand it before I try to talk about it. And so, no, I'm hard to find. Um, I'm off the radar screen. I have a Facebook page that is largely in neglect since I ran for mayor five years ago. Um, But I hope that one of these days, after I have um, improved upon the the body of thought that I have accumulated so far, maybe I will resurface and do another lecture at Mensa. Um, But at this point, I am I am trying to make the best use of what time I have left, realizing that I'm running out of time. Okay, well, that's as honest an answer as we could expect. No, I'll take it. Yeah, but we think, um, you know, you are one of a kind and, and, and need to be recognized. So I think probably we have time maybe for one more question. Yeah. Um, did you have something, Ben? Because I do. Oh, no, go for it. Okay. Maybe this is... Uh, you, you wouldn't be comfortable answering this, but I'll, I'll put it out there anyway. At what point do you think that an attachment, if, if this is even how it works, if an, that an attachment would become what is traditionally known as possession, stuff I was dealing with in the 70s? Paul, 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 I was involved with a case that would blow your skirt up. I was called into a case that the local diocese wouldn't touch. And I was oddly enough brought into it by that acupuncturist aforementioned, um, the practice event is called Hidden Well. Um, I was approached by the doctor to help her because she said, listen, I'm going to be removing uh, something from a child which the Catholic Church, which the exorcist won't touch. She said, now, the reason I'm calling you is, she said, it's it's one thing to release this stuff from somebody. It's another thing to contain it. She said, because it would be irresponsible of me to free this thing only for it to jump into somebody else. Now, gentlemen, I've seen a lot of things in my lifetime, but I never saw anything like this case. And And basically, this involved a family from Australia... They had three children, the youngest of which was about two or three years old. And um, oddly enough, the, the, the family told me that on the day they gave birth to this child, they were in Australia, they went into the bush to engage in some sort of aboriginal procedure. These people were hippie, 
spooky kooky types and new agers and they they go into the brush and and the and the woman gives birth to this child in the wild and they said that shortly after the baby is born something comes bounding out of the brush on four legs it was black and it jumped into the baby's body and within the next two or three years the child began displaying the classic signs of possession and and so I was called into this case because the doctor said look I can I can rid this thing from this child but she said I'm, I need help with containment and the things that I will not repeat it on this show because some of this stuff is un, unspeakable and you have impressionable listeners that would never forgive me if I told you what I witnessed but the, th- the reason I tell you is this that some of this stuff is, 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 as you describe in your book, Paul, I have seen a classic case of possession. And, and if you ask me how the story ends, I will tell you. We made appointments to actually conduct the ceremony, the rites, and, and to help these people. And when we went back to the house, they were gone. They disappeared, and we haven't heard from them since. So we never did what they originally asked us to do. But what I saw manifested in this child put the fear of God in me, and I don't believe in God. Well, there you have it. Marie, we're just about out of time. Thank you so much. You're you're always our good friend, more like a brother, and uh, we'll be in touch off the air, and it will not be another seven years before you're back on the show. Mm. And flies, don't it? Yeah, right. (laughs) Yes, it does, when you're having fun. Okay, folks, Marie Silver, Renaissance man. Okay, Ben, let's take away our announcements. Alrighty, so on Saturday, February 15th, uh, from 1 to 4 p.m., my dad and I make our appearance at the 5th Annual Book Lovers and Authors Expo uh, at the Cumberland Public Library. Uh, that's 1464 Diamond Hill Road in Cumberland, Rhode Island. Uh, we won't give a lecture, but we and a number of other authors will be there with our books, and it's a lot of fun. It is. On April 3rd, 4th, and 5th, uh, we'll be at the New England Parafest in Kittery, Maine. This is the first day that, of, first time that event is going to be over three days. Now, uh, the first two days of it, uh, Friday and Saturday, will be at the Community Center at 120 Rogers Road in Kittery. Uh, for Sunday, the 5th, we move to the Lions Club at 117 State Road for the rest of the event, uh, which will include a live broadcast of this show between noon and 1 with a panel of the speakers. All proceeds from this event uh, go to help support the historic Hilldale Cemetery in Haverhill, Massachusetts, and toward the upkeep of veterans' grave sites there. Uh, along with ourselves, speakers, almost all of whom you have heard on this show, will include Bill Brock of the Discovery Channel's Monsters Underground, paranormal investigator Shane Searway, one of our co-hosts, uh, ancient sites expert Dennis Stone, Bigfoot hunter Dave McCulloch, re- reincarnation researcher Stephen Sacklarius, Researcher and broadcaster Tim Weisberg, now the host of the hit nighttime show Midnight in the Desert, founded by Art Bell, and many more. Order tickets at EssexCountyGhostProject.org. And naturally, we'll be back at the Exeter UFO Festival on Labor Day weekend. That's September 5th and 6th as uh, speakers, and we will do our fifth annual live broadcast from the historic Exeter Town Hall on Sunday the 6th at noon. And the event is sponsored by the Exeter Area Kiwanis Club to raise funds for local children's charities. Uh, there'll be other events throughout the year, of course, including the Greater New England UFO Conference in Massachusetts on Columbus Day weekend. Uh, I'm honored to have been asked to be the keynote speaker this year. Uh, that's uh, to, I guess, uh, mark the uh, 50th anniversary of my <laughs> descent into the paranormal uh, yeah, in uh, 1970. Yeah. <laughs> So you can check out our books, including Behind the Paranormal, Everything You Know is Wrong, and Behind the Paranormal 2, Bigfoot, Mothman, and Monsters You've Never Heard of. Go ahead and get the phone, Ben. I'll, I'll do the rest of this. Okie doke. Yeah, and also, um, uh, now, Dancing Past the Graveyard, Poltergeist, Parasites, Parallel Worlds, and God. Uh, they're available from online retailers and in some stores. Uh, also, uh, for autographed copies, please visit the online bookstore at BehindTheParanormal.com. And uh, let's see, we've got uh, a little bit more. Uh, also at BehindTheParanormal.com, you can find out more about the show or many cases over the years. And uh, the, the site has been the subject of many attacks, so the 800-plus shows that were uh, recorded shows that were posted there uh, are now, we've kind of fanned them out over the uh 
podcast platforms that are most popular. You can get them there. Yes. Uh, iTunes, uh, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as well as 2010. Spotify. Also on yes. iTunes, if you give us a, a rating and a review, that helps us tremendously. So what's on for next week, Ben? So next week, uh, that is February 9th, all the way from Brazil, we will welcome researcher and author uh, Thiago – is it Tiago or Chiago? Chiago. Chiago Luis Tichetti uh, to talk about the seldom covered subject of UFOs in South America. It's spelled Tiago, but it's pronounced Chiago. So. Anyway, uh, no time for our quote. Uh, I'm Paul Eno. And I'm Ben Eno. And thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey. And we shall see you next time on Behind the Paranormal. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.